thanks, Andrew, uh, for, for having the Science and Public Leadership Fellows Program. It's been an honor to be a part of it. And it's uh, great to speak to you guys today about something that is uh, very close to my heart. So uh, as Andrew said, I am a climate scientist. And this is uh, kind of I blend a lot of different things. I'm a chemist. I'm a geologist. Uh, this picture that I'm showing right here is my favorite place on Earth. It's called Palmyra Island. It's my primary research site. And there's a sign-up sheet in the back there for people who want to come to me on the next field trip. Um, so it looks pretty nice, right? Uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, something that we found by one of those uh, funny accidents and uh, on a Saudi yacht. So that's a story for another time. And several beers, which I, I can't have right now. But anyway, um, uh, between having babies, which is rare these days, I do go out and collect samples for the reconstruction of climate. Now, lest you sign up too quickly, you'll see that I also go to the caves of Borneo, which are located approximately 20 kilometers from the nearest airport. And that's all uh, with a backpack on your back, uh, trying to escape cobras and fiery caterpillars and um, weird mulu foot fungus things that start eating you from the ground up. So um, you know, for those of you who aren't faint of heart, please come and join me. But I, I do have a lot of fun in the field. But I'm really driven by, um, by the climate questions that that face us and very passionate about that, as I'll discuss a little later. So uh, really, the big challenge that I'm trying to address is how can we improve climate model forecasts of what's coming? And what matters to us most is not the evolution of global average temperature, per se, but um, actually what's going to happen in Georgia, where I'm from, with respect to precipitation. We've gone through a lot of droughts in the last several years, uh, floods. Uh, rainfall is critically important. And what this slide simply illustrates for you is a map of model projections of what we know about future rainfall over the next 100 years. And there are some blue areas that get wet. There are some red areas that get dry. And there's a lot of white areas, which means that by flipping a coin, you would have about as accurate a prediction as what we know about rainfall in that area over the next 100 years, literally. Of all the models that we can bring to bear, half of them say it gets wet, half of them say it gets dry. So there are a lot of uh, white areas on that map. There are a lot of uncertainties in these fanciest models that we can bring to bear on the question. Important to keep in mind that 70% of the world's population lives in a lot of those white areas in the tropics uh, where uh, these trends in rainfall will determine um, things like um, the climate refugee migration patterns, uh, the sustainability of agriculture in those areas, et cetera, et cetera, as I'm sure you can all imagine. So um, unfortunately, rainfall records only go back 79, uh, to 1979. And so that leaves us to try to fill a gap with so-called paleoclimate data. That's why I come in studying, in this case, uh, showing you some images of my coral research, where we use uh, coral records uh, from the last 1,000 years, the last 50 years, to try to compare climate variability of the past, climate variability of the present day, and then try to validate some of those models that are um, plagued by such deep uncertainties right now. And this is this kind of reconstruction that we get. Um, we have uh, a climate reconstruction that goes from 1000 AD to present. We can see a couple of fundamental observations. Number one, there is a trend in the data in the last part that's quite striking in the last millennium. And there is uh, cooler conditions earlier in the millennium. And when we think about um, what we can ask models to, to verify this, do they simulate this? Um, they simulate an unprecedented trend in the late 20th century. That's good. They do not simulate those earlier cool conditions. So that's a problem with our model data. Now, how do we understand the framing of a climate model uncertainty uh, in, a, in a reasonable way without being stung by paralysis? And this is where uh, my experience in outreach uh, comes into play. Um, I'm out there every single day, practically, whether it's on an airplane seat or in a school or at a, at a creationist church damn it, uh, trying to uh, make some headway on this. And wh where does that leave us? Um, this is something that I've been trying to conceptualize, talk to people about, um, have a new voice in the climate arena with respect to uh, climate consensus. This is settled science on the bottom. Is CO2 warming the planet, yes or no? This is our job as scientists to sell this. We have not sold this well. It's our fault. We have reflection, deep reflection, coming back at us from society to tell us this. Uh, highly uncertain science, the category of impacts. 
Um, this is something that we can communicate a lot better in terms of uncertainty. And last but not least, then we can have a national level discussion based on moral grounds or economic grounds uh, to decide what to do about it. But my job is right down here in the blue, and we need to be very careful not to blend the blue and the yellow when we discuss things to the public. And so I'm trying to um, design a, a better infrastructure uh, than the IPCC to uh, think about addressing these kinds of challenges. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks,